Dialysis is a type of kidney replacement therapy that removes toxic byproducts of protein metabolism like urea, uric acid, and creatinine, waste products from the blood, as well as excess fluid. Additionally, through dialysis, electrolyte levels and acid-base imbalances can be corrected. There are two types of dialysis, hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis. Now, let's review some renal physiology. Each kidney is made up of millions of tiny functional units called nephrons, each of which consist of a renal corpuscle and the renal tubules. The renal corpuscle is where blood filtration happens, and it's made up of the glomerulus, which is a tiny bundle of capillaries, and the Bowman's capsule, which is a cup-shaped structure surrounding the glomerulus. Blood flows through the glomerulus, and then water and small solutes are filtered into Bowman's capsule, creating an ultrafiltrate of blood. Then this ultrafiltrate goes through the renal tubules, where electrolytes and water can be secreted or reabsorbed. In addition, they are important in regulating acid-base balance. The kidneys also clear blood of metabolic wasteful substances and toxins. Finally, what leaves the tubules becomes the urine, which flows into the bladder and is excreted during micturition. Okay, now let's look at some situations when dialysis is indicated. Most often, clients who require dialysis have end-stage chronic kidney disease, which means the kidneys have lost almost all their function. In this case, both hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis are adequate long-term options. However, there are some urgent conditions that benefit from dialysis, and hemodialysis is usually preferred in these situations. These clients also usually have associated acute kidney injury. Indications for urgent dialysis include pulmonary edema unresponsive to conventional treatment, life-threatening hyperkalemia when potassium levels are over 6.5 milliequivalents per liter and there are associated electrocardiographic abnormalities, acidosis unresponsive to conventional treatment, signs of uremia like encephalopathy or pericarditis, as well as intoxications, especially with methanol or ethylene glycol and certain medication overdoses like lithium. Now, to perform dialysis on a client, first you'll need either vascular access for hemodialysis or peritoneal access for peritoneal dialysis. Let's start with hemodialysis, which requires venous access. In an acute setting, a temporary venous access is obtained through a temporary catheter in the subclavian, internal jugular, or femoral vein. Clients on chronic hemodialysis need a more permanent access, such as an arteriovenous or AV fistula, where a connection between a small artery and a vein in the arm, or less often the leg, is made surgically. Another semi-permanent access is a so-called permanent catheter that can be located in the same veins as the temporary catheter, but it can be used for a long time, is more comfortable for the client, and there's a lower risk for infection than with the temporary access. Finally, peritoneal access can be obtained by inserting a silicone rubber catheter in the peritoneal cavity. Okay, now let's look at the principles of dialysis, which are diffusion, osmosis, and ultrafiltration. Diffusion is the movement of solutes from a greater concentration to a lesser concentration until the two solutions have the same concentration of solutes. Osmosis is the health education platform that makes learning easy and fun, but in this case, it refers to the movement of fluid from an area of lesser solute concentration to an area of greater solute concentration. For example, glucose creates an osmotic gradient across the membrane and is able to pull excess fluid through that gradient. Finally, ultrafiltration refers to water and fluid removal according to a pressure gradient across the membrane, so water typically goes from where there's more of it, like the body of a client with fluid overload, to where there's less of it, like the other side of the dialysis membrane. Now, to understand how this works, let's look at the dialysis machine. One of the most important components of the dialysis machine is the dialyzer, through which the client's blood is filtered. The client will be connected to the dialysis machine using the venous access or the AV fistula using two tubules. One tubule will be responsible for taking the client's blood and leading it to the dialyzer, and the other one will return the filtered blood from the dialyzer. 
The dialysis machine also has other important components, like the dialysate, which is a type of solution used in the dialyzer to create a pressure gradient that makes diffusion happen. Other components include the blood pumps to help draw blood to the client, an arterial pressure monitor, an air trap or a sensor to detect air bubbles so that we can stop them from getting into the circulation. Finally, the dialysis machine also contains a heparin pump. That's because anticoagulation is necessary during dialysis due to the risk of blood clots. In clients with a high risk for bleeding, a lower dose of heparin, citrate, or no anticoagulation can be used. Finally, let's look at peritoneal dialysis, which uses the peritoneal membrane as a dialyzer. Through the abdominal catheter, certain solutions can be introduced in the abdominal cavity and dwell in the peritoneal space for a certain amount of time, usually four hours. During this time, toxins are filtered through the peritoneal membrane. Afterwards, the fluid is drained and a new solution is introduced into the peritoneal cavity. Okay, let's look at the care you'll provide for a client receiving hemodialysis. Your nursing priorities are to prepare your client for hemodialysis, monitor for complications, and provide psychosocial support. Now, to begin preparing your client for hemodialysis, check their pretreatment laboratory test results and assess their LOC, weight, heart, and lung sounds. Also look for the presence of edema. When assessing their vital signs, remember to avoid checking their blood pressure in the extremity with the hemodialysis access site and place a sign above your client's bed alerting other care providers which limb has the access site. Then, closely examine their access site, checking for skin breakdown and infection, skin color and temperature, as well as capillary refill and pulses distal to the access site. If your client has an arteriovenous fistula or graft, also be sure to check the site's patency by auscultating for a brute and palpating for a vibration or thrill. Immediately report signs of infection, such as redness, swelling, tenderness or drainage, decreased pulses, sluggish capillary refill or cool extremities, or if a brute or thrill are absent. Then, prepare for additional assessment and interventions to support the function of the hemodialysis access site. Next, administer the prescribed fluids to prevent hypotension during the procedure, hold any medications that may affect blood pressure or that are easily removed during dialysis, and administer the prescribed anticoagulants to prevent the formation of blood clots. During hemodialysis, keep a close eye on your client to prevent complications. Immediately report if hypotension develops. Then, slow the ultrafiltration rate and place them in the Trendelenburg position. Administer an IV bolus of normal saline, initiate supplemental oxygen as ordered, and continue to monitor them until they are stable. Also, be sure to assess your client for clinical manifestations of dialysis disequilibrium syndrome and report restlessness, nausea, vomiting, headache, blurred vision, altered LOC, or muscle cramps. Slow the ultrafiltration, provide comfort measures as needed, and prepare to initiate additional interventions as prescribed. After hemodialysis is complete, flush the access device and apply pressure to prevent bleeding. Continue monitoring your client's vital signs, heart and lung sounds, and weight, and check their post-dialysis laboratory test results. If your client requires long-term dialysis, be sure to administer the hepatitis B vaccine to your client to prevent hepatitis. Finally, take time to talk to them about their feelings and provide psychosocial support. Encourage them to discuss their feelings about being dependent on dialysis, evaluate their support system, and work with the case manager to coordinate their ongoing care needs. Okay, let's move on to client and family teaching. Begin by explaining how dialysis does some of the work of the kidneys by removing waste products and extra fluid from their body. Let them know that it is common for their blood pressure to decrease during the procedure, so instruct them to let you know if they experience lightheadedness or dizziness. 
Reassure them that they will be monitored closely during the procedure. Also discuss what to expect after dialysis sessions, such as feeling tired and bleeding, and encourage them to rest afterwards and to monitor for bleeding for at least six hours after dialysis is complete. Next, teach them how to care for their dialysis access site. Instruct them to avoid tight clothes or jewelry on the extremity that has the fistula or graft and to avoid activities that compress the extremity, such as carrying heavy items or sleeping on the affected side. Also teach them how to feel for a vibration, called a thrill, over the access site and explain that a thrill means the access site is intact and working. Be sure to emphasize the importance of avoiding blood draws or blood pressure measurements on that arm. Then, teach them how to clean the access site and change the dressing to prevent infection and to watch it closely for any changes. Instruct them to contact their healthcare provider immediately if there are signs of infection, like redness, warmth, swelling, or pain, if they notice bleeding around their access site, an absence of a thrill, or if their hands become cold or pale. Also talk to them about the modifications they will need to make to their diet and fluid intake. Ensure they work closely with the renal dietitian to plan a diet that is low in sodium, potassium, and phosphorus, as well as the right balance of protein and fluids. Lastly, emphasize the importance of taking their prescribed vitamin and mineral supplements. Finally, be sure to remind them to let all of their other healthcare providers know that they are on dialysis. Stress the importance of keeping all their follow-up appointments and to adhere to their hemodialysis schedule. All right, as a quick recap, dialysis is a type of kidney replacement therapy that removes toxic byproducts of protein metabolism, waste products, and excess fluid from the body, as well as corrects electrolyte and acid-base imbalances. Dialysis is needed in clients with end-stage chronic kidney disease, acute kidney injury, pulmonary edema or acidosis unresponsive to conventional treatment, life-threatening hyperkalemia, uremia, and intoxication. Dialysis works by having the client's blood pass by dialysate, which is a special solution used to create a pressure gradient, through a semi-permeable membrane to filter the blood using the principles of diffusion, osmosis, and ultrafiltration. The two types of dialysis are hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis. Hemodialysis requires venous access with a temporary catheter in the subclavian, internal jugular, or femoral vein, or, for more permanent access, an AV fistula, graft, or shunt. During hemodialysis, the client's blood is filtered through the dialysis machine where one tubule takes the client's blood through the dialyzer and another tubule returns the filtered blood to the client. On the other hand, peritoneal dialysis uses a catheter inserted in the peritoneal cavity to deliver dialysate in the abdominal cavity where it dwells for the prescribed time during which toxins and excess fluid are filtered through the peritoneal membrane and later drained through the catheter along with the dialysate. Nursing priorities include preparing the client for dialysis, monitoring for complications, and providing psychosocial support. Client and family teaching focuses on explaining how dialysis works, what to expect regarding their treatment schedule and side effects, how to care for their access site, nutrition considerations, and when to contact their healthcare provider. Helping current and future clinicians focus, learn, retain, and thrive. Learn more.